All right, you guys, we are digging back into <laughs> Brent Kopaka. Okay. And, um, you know, we got some expected messages uh, with issues talking about this topic with our last video. But, but here's the thing. The community's interested in it. Yep. So we're going to talk about it. And we're just going to do it in a respectful fashion. And I do feel like we did that on the last video. I feel like we've talked uh, highly and respectfully of military, the issues he was going through, um, and any potential connections with the Idaho 4 case and Brent Kopaka case. Um, so, again, like we said the first video, uh, you know, it he had a lot going on. He was a soldier who gave his life to the to his country, to the U S um, he was uh, hit with a car bomb, an IED in a Humvee. And uh, it gave him TBI and PTSD. And ever since he came back from that war, uh, he was never the same, you know, and a lot of people, which you'll hear, but a lot of people that knew him said that, you know, it, he stayed over there. He never came back, uh, which is really sad. And in my opinion, needs to put a huge highlight spotlight and everything in between on the issues of uh, our soldiers that come back. You know, if anything comes out of this research and this story, uh, it should be that we need to do more for these soldiers to help them overcome these issues. Because I, I look, they sign up for four years or six years, or maybe they're a career soldier. I don't really know. But at the end of that term, they should be able to come home and be, mentally be and home. physically be home. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is an issue that's dear to my heart. I, after like listening to this after you know wh which is what you guys are going to hear in a minute um hearing more of his story it it's literally brought me to tears like it is heartbreaking it's heart-wrenching um it sounds like he was like a really nice guy you know like in a lot of ways where he always was so close to people's kids and would give them gifts and, you know, was like a big kid himself when he was around them. But then he had this trauma. Yeah. That this other was, side. it was literally consuming him at all of him mm -hmm. um, to where he couldn't be that happy person anymore. Um, he couldn't be around yeah. for them the way I'm sure he wanted to be. It's yeah. just really, and really sad. You know, we brought up connections with because a, a lot of people in the community draw the connection between the Idaho Four and Brent Kopaka. Go, Kopaka is how he says it. Um, this is a whole situation in its own, though. It is. It is the Brent the the shooting at uh, his what is it coffee coffee house apartments. coffee house apartments is its own thing, and it, there's some very strange situations going on there. Um, but with the Idaho Four case, I've asked the question, whereas it look. If he is a part of it, it how much is he to even blame? How much would he to blame when it's, I'm assuming, would be caused by delusions, PTSD, the TBI, a lot of these things he had He's straight going up on. hallucinations. I mean. Yeah, I know. He was straight up hallucinating. He, he straight up felt like people were following him. So is it possible well, that he could have felt like the people that were following him just so happened to be at this house and the soldier turned on? Like, I don't think those are unfair what? questions to ask in this situation. Um, however... I also don't think it's fair to go down this road without any objective evidence. And that's what we're trying to look into. So I want to be very clear. That's not, we're not trying to make these connections. We're literally just looking to see, are there any connections? The connections you know? already been made. Okay. Somebody's already made the connection between Kopaka and the Idaho four. And we don't necessarily agree with that connection or disagree with it. It's just out there and it's a theory. Um, and Regardless, I feel like Kopaka, this is its own situation, and he was wronged severely. 
whatever happened in this, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem right. But we have to look at the evidence and the situation objectively to decide if there's actually any connection at all. Yep. Yep. I you agree. know what I mean? So, so yes, this theory is out there and people have talked about it. Is it our intention to try to force a connection? No, we're just looking at the evidence as it's presented to us. Yeah, absolutely. With the utmost respect possible. So what you guys are about to listen to is, uh, you know, we, like we said, we put in a FOIA uh, to get uh, all the evidence presented from the shooting that day. Um, and it's just been sitting there for months, like six months, you know. And and this is one of the interviews with somebody that was very close to him. Uh, when somebody's very close to another person, they're able to tell you more about who they were, their character, and what kind of stuff they had going on, which I think you hear a lot of in here. And uh, it, bring, it raises some big questions in some areas. It, it, it helps explain a little bit about him in other areas. Um, but all in all, it is very, 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 very interesting in my opinion. Uh, so I, I hope you guys will learn and find something interesting in it and then we'll go through it. So today's date is December 20th, 2022. The time now is 1205 PM. This is in reference to case number 22-021085, an officer-involved shooting, which occurred on November 15th, 2022, in the city of Pullman. This is going to be the statement of... Pretty close. And uh, Jeff, can you go ahead and state your name and spell your name for me, please? Jeff. And what is your birthday? And can you go ahead and give us your address, please? Lower apartment or apartment B, Pullman, Washington, 99163. Okay. And Sarah, uh, go ahead and state your name and spelling, please. Um. And your birthday? And I understand you both reside together yes yes Yes. okay so i want to have you repeat that yeah (laughs) all right so you'd called me on friday and said that you had some information that you wanted to share um jeff regarding um uh mr kopaka yes and why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you what you want to say um Oh, before I do that here real quick, you understand the statement's being recorded? Yes. Okay, we have your permission to do so? Yes. Okay, why don't you go ahead. Okay. Brent, he, he stayed with us a lot. He was over visiting with us quite often. He would hang out outside a lot. Um, he, he said he felt like he was at home with us. He didn't feel safe in his apartment with his new roommates. He was feeling sexually intimidated is the best way to phrase that, I think. He was being flirted with, and they were sexually explicit in front of him and coercing him to come to bed with him, things like that, to the point where he actually, when he wouldn't stay with us, he would stay at a hotel right down the street. And it was so often that we were all very concerned about him. We were looking for another place for him to live. It was just Pullman. It's difficult. So, Did you guys ever witness anything like that? I had not. Heather, our roommate, has... I just has, had his direct statements. Okay. Our, our roommate, Heather, she has. She had been in the apartment, and so had Darren, her husband, and they had witnessed some of that and seen how sexually overt these two roommates were with him. So, Can you give an example? Um, I guess there was, what was it, the last time they were sitting in the living room and it made Darren so uncomfortable that he left. Um, Heather said she witnessed them trying to coerce him into bed with him. So. Okay. And she was over at his apartment? Yes, at his apartment. I I hadn't been inside myself. I had only dropped him off outside. But I got many, many messages from him asking, you know, can I come over? I just don't feel safe here. Things are not okay. He, He was very obvious that he did not feel comfortable in his apartment with his two roommates. Okay. So. Now, how do you guys know Brent? He was introduced to us through a friend, Colleen. 
she was kind of off and on dating him a little bit here, a little bit there. He, we all know he had PTSD. We all know he wasn't well. Um, I'm bipolar and I've, I've gone through the rigmarole myself a lot. My oldest son is also bipolar. He struggles with a lot of things. Um, he was a good dude though. I trusted we, him alone with my kids. Yeah. He sat in the living room and played games with my kids, our kids, uh, he nine, kids seven, presents. six. So they would get overwhelmed. He he would get overwhelmed with it. He'd go outside. He he. <laughs> I'm I'm not bad mouthing how it all went down. It, it yeah, is everything what, that it, happened. It, it is what it we is. Support. You know. Um, we we I know think, he was a. He could be a dangerous person. We knew he had issues and that if you pushed the wrong button, we also knew that he was not he, he, currently... He never... No, no. When, no. You, when you say no. a dangerous person, what do you mean? Well, we, not, we knew of his we, military we he wasn't background. Well, he was, he was in PTSD mode a lot. We would go to the store and he'd say, did you see them taking our picture? And I'm like, no, yeah. that, that didn't happen. So he That's, had delusions? He did. Okay. Yeah. He did. He, um... And he wasn't, he didn't lie to us about any of them. Him and I talked a lot about things like that, and I tried to, you know, bring so he, him back down to earth. He trusted you guys. He did. He trusted he, us a lot. He was very concerned about other people. Yeah. And if he More felt than welcome, anything. He was constantly, you know, hey, I just, it was like, dude, you come into our house. Be, he didn't want to be know, a burden. Be, he didn't want to be in the way. Yeah. He, he always in thought any he was. Way, he was constantly concerned about other, other people. You could tell he never left the battlefield, really. You could tell whatever injury he had, he brought home a lot of the battlefield with him. Did he talk about his battlefield injuries? He told us that he had been in an, a Humvee that was hit with um, ICB. IED? IED, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then he spent two years in hospitals after that, before they brought him home. What branch of service was he in? So, Army. Army, okay. Yeah. Do you know what his job was? I don't know specifically. No. We never discussed it past that. Okay. It we, was. We didn't want to. We were trying to anything. keep him in the here and now. You know, hey man, step back. You know, you really, you know, let's. Who the fuck cares who you are here? And he was a it's hippie. It's you. He That's wasn't. how I was trying to deal with the, his delusions with him of the, oh, someone just took my picture. Dude. Who cares who you are? I mean, you're you're a vet. You're, he didn't play in his, his re no. no, no, no. He, he, no. he would, he would bring check it to out our outside knowledge. and do his his calm down. I think that was mostly because he didn't feel comfortable being inside. He, find anything he for yep. Mm -hmm. He talked about um, <laughs> going to the bathroom and having to be on alert. Because they drop stuff on you when you're going to the bathroom and and stuff like that. Um, Brent and I bonded over star watching and yeah. solar events and things like that. That was he was very much more of a hippie than an army man. I think when he returned, but he couldn't find his way to ground most of the time. Did he say where he was? Which battlefield he was on? I I, I, I thought he said two tours in Iraq. Oh, Iraq, not, yeah. Af not Afghanistan. No, I, 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 I could have that Iraq. wrong too yeah, because be. I didn't discuss it with him. Okay. I thought that being here in the here and now, with his friends, and he just wanted to put that behind him. Yeah, and we're. He had told me once that he lodged some complaints mm -hmm. with the landlord On his over his roommates. Okay. Um, Noise levels, um, dancing around in their underwear. Um, he stayed at the quality Constant sexual in advances. Five or um, six days a week, he'd stay at a hotel. Yeah, and pretty sure. He made himself didn't broke. He, <laughs> didn't he run all that off of his bank card? Yeah. I don't. I don't he, think he ran in cash. No, he didn't. And he'd stay at La Quinta as well. Um, yeah, they called over, us from there one time. Do you know about when those complaints would have been filed? Within the last four months, he hasn't lived there that long. Mm -hmm. um, that was a new roommate situation with him, I think, set up through the Coug, I believe it was. Since was, the start of college yes, season? Yes. He he had another place with another couple of roommates. That dissolved. They, the other roommates party a lot. They ended up getting evicted. 
these kids partied a lot too, but not as excessive, I think, as the first group. He just, he, he was he was a grown man trying to find, you know, solidary housing in a place where you just can't find that and can't afford it, unfortunately. Did, so. you, did he do anything for work? He did not, no. We talked about looking. him getting a job. Um, he struggled just the day-to-day routine. We were starting to mm-hmm. teach him how to get onto that type of routine. Jeff and I kind of randomly help everybody in town anyways, and so Brent right. ended up becoming one of our yeah. people that we were trying to help and guide. So. Where does he get his money? Through his um, military. Is he retired medical? He is or fully or retired medical. 100% and disability? Yes, medical. and early. So he, he didn't serve full term. I think whatever happened, he ended up getting a pretty large settlement sum. Gotcha. So. Okay. Um, is, are you aware of any counseling that he's in or we had, any therapists of any sort? We had talked about getting him into counseling. Uh, we had talked about getting him down to police mm-hmm. service counseling, and he had actually said he had set up an appointment and gone down and talked to someone there to start off. I don't know if he had gotten any farther than that. That was only a few weeks ago. Are there VA resources in Poland? There are not. There are not. There are not. Has he tried in Spokane, do you know? I, I he was very that limited that he, on transportation. Yeah. He he was serving out um, a DUI conviction him. down in Nevada. Right. Yeah. Um, and he was supposed to have a court date. Here this week. Yeah. So he didn't have a he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a car. No. He had well he was buying a car off our roommate. But yes. he had no legal way to make it his until he got his court date he settled. Didn't have a driver's license. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So he, he ran into you know, he ran into some issues before with his illnesses and with his injuries and he was trying to rectify them. He just he came to the wrong place to find solitude, I think, unfortunately. And I kept telling him we need to find you some VA resources and I think that really honestly the the PTSD from everything that went on, it, it was hard to watch him live in half there and so half here. So he wasn't medicated that you know, are aware of? Not that we know of, no. Okay. No. Um, have you ever witnessed any, other than photographs or paranoia of the bathroom, that sort of thing, any, have you been present during any delusional experiences that went extended period of time? Um, there were, it, beside, you know, including the did he see him take my picture? He he would feed into that. It, it would become a thing where he would just kind of keep going around and around with him, and no matter what you did, you couldn't talk him out of it. And he would just wander off for a couple of days, and then he'd come back. No idea where he went. No idea, really. I, I'm assuming he went to a hotel, because that's usually where he called mm-hmm. us from. And so he'd say he checked out, and he just slept for a couple of days and hung out there. He struggled with sleeping, I think, at night at all because of everything in his past. So he wandered town a lot. There were a couple times we'd get up to go pick up my niece from work at 11 o'clock at night, and he was wandering the streets just in our neighborhood. So he... Where's your guys' place in relativity to his? Um, we are about a mile. We are right next to... I'm from here, so... Um, is that towards the Walmart and... Yes, we're, we're on Grand Avenue, the, the by the... And, and yeah, so you get to the end, of it and we're about an eighth of a mile from. Okay. There. That's it. Right. Yeah. Um, any alcohol history usage? Yes. I mean, other than I know he had a DUI. He was he was an avid. Um, uh, people want to say alcoholic, but he was self medicating. Gotcha. He he was using substance to suppress. Because he would say he's an alcoholic, and I'm like, I don't think you are. You don't act like an alcoholic. You don't act like you have and to have it. he didn't consume that much. No. Well, but he, it was just a he daily. He did. He carried a bottle thing. with him daily, or he drank an 18-pack of seltzers daily. He okay. Did. He had this with him at all times. I guess he hid that for me more than... He yeah, wasn't he was, proud he was, of he was it. He alcohol pretty good. He was, consistent. and he wasn't proud of it. He could tell yep. that he wanted a he way out, hurting. which is why I say he wasn't he, an alcoholic. He wanted help. He wanted to... Move he forward. He wanted to put it. Yeah, he was trying to shut the him. voices up, shut the noises up. Any uh, any understanding of any illicit drug use or anything that you're aware of? Yes, he did use amphetamines, to my knowledge. So. What kind? Am- amphetamines, the so meth. Meth, yeah. So meth. Yeah. Smoke it or. As far as I know, yeah. Um, I know there was a period where he was going through eating it, and I kept telling him that was the stupidest thing I had ever heard. <laughs> 
that you're going to destroy your intestines and your stomach lining and you'll never eat again. And he backed off that after a couple of weeks. So but you're he, not, you weren't aware of that? No, I was not. It's just, it's, first of all, let me, my condolences to you guys for you. the loss of your friend. We, we thank you for taking the time to listen. Of course, yeah. Of course. We got to have the whole picture for this. Well, yeah, and that's what we want to make sure you guys have is that it, it wasn't. This wasn't a random act of violence. This wasn't something that came up out of the blue. This yeah. is something that's been happening. Gotcha. And I apologize if I was short over the phone with you, but it was just you were emotional, and it was, I was trying to get my point across. You, yes, you diffused me fine. I, I appreciate it. I, okay. I really appreciate your time. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, this is hard for all of us. We had to tell our kids, and it, it's because they were. He was close with them too, mm-hmm. really close with our kids. He would bring them presents for their birthday, and anything he ever did for anyone was very thought out, very for that person and indiv- individual. He's Never. a caring person. Very caring. Yeah. Did this surprise you that this happened? No. no, we knew before you guys announced his name. We knew right that day. Because of where the location was yeah. at. Not just the location, the, just we we knew. We just had a feeling he hadn't answered us for a day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God he's not hurting anymore. You know, yeah. But it's... <laughs> It's never anything that we want to have an outcome like this happen. And, and we understand that. I'm guessing you guys talked to him for a while. Tried yeah. to talk to him. Yeah. I'm yeah, just guessing. I can't share that point. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I understand all that. Um, um, and, you know, at one you point know. when we're done, all this is going to be public disclosable. Um, but these type of investigations, uh, by law, we are required to keep them very compartmentalized. Um, yep. So... Well, we understand, like, the <laughs> nobody yeah, down the street knew. You guys were very quiet. The entire neighborhood did not know. Nobody at the gas station, nobody at the pot shops, nobody that works along Bishop really Probably knew. Probably because of the elevation difference. Possibly, yeah. Uh, a lot of people yeah. just kind of, they, they said they heard one one shot, and that was it. And so, it's, that's, you guys did your job, and we don't, we yeah, don't think we're not. We're not here to argue wrong. that. I, we're just saying that I believe that he was pushed into the situation. And I, I finally wish, just reacted violently because... I it, wish there were resources it, for him here, too. And I w- wish he hadn't reacted that way. And probably the more... The more you guys my, made my, the harder. My, my guess is, you know, the more militant you got, the more it set him off. And that's just... It's you know, unfortunate, yeah. but... I think, honestly, a lot of that's on the military. They need to deprogram some of these kids a little bit more before they send them home. So. Anyway. Yeah, I, I can, you know, I've been to combat twice. I know, I know what the experience is. Uh, you know, I, of course, I have no idea what he experienced during his time, but uh, I do understand um, what a lot of these guys coming back you know, have suffered. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you guys would like to share that might be Could you bring your phone to us? I, I did. No, I didn't. I left it in the car. I can, if you, uh, I can try and forward you a message I got from him that sure. tells me that it, it, that it was a verbal message. Um, I think it was, uh, some of this was slightly premeditated on his part. Um, I think the day before, two days before, he told Heather that, you know, he saw himself being killed by the cops. And the message I got from him was asking if I believed that everybody had an impact, whether whether one life had a major impact on everybody, on the masses, or if it was more personal, like purgatory type thing. Do you think this is intentional? I, I think he may have, yeah. I think he may have done this to get attention to his, his plight, to what was going on. So, cause the, the message is ominous now, but it was only a couple days before. So. Yeah, if you want to share that, here's my business card. I wrote the case number on the back that okay. um, is assigned to this case. The okay. best number to, uh, to reach me if you need to do it by phone it would be the cell number. Okay. Um, or there's my email. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, messenger message on Facebook. So okay. I should be able to forward that to your cell. Okay. Is it still up there? The message? Yeah. yeah, it's on my Facebook. It's, it's, on, on, it's on my messenger. Oh. It's a conversation between the two of gotcha. us. Yeah, where he so. sent me an audio message out of the blue asking what my belief on 
you know, one person's life was, whether it would impact others or whether it would just impact that person. Yeah. So it, well, I would be more than happy to include that in the case file so we have okay. a better understanding of, of his historical leading up to this. It always helps um, helps us to have an understanding of what happened. Yeah, it, it we feels martyrish right now. Yeah, right. That's, right. Yeah. that's what just what we want to help you guys get. Is well, why. I, appreciate, yeah. Yeah, I certainly appreciate your time, and I definitely appreciate you guys driving up here in well, this of course. horrible, of course. horrible weather. Well, we thank you for today. taking it time. It helps us, I think, find us. a little closure, too. We've been talking a bit with the family as well. So. Oh, good, yeah, because yeah. we, we have, too. So um, my supervisor um, is the one that's communicating with the family, and we've got a one on each side of the parents because mm-hmm. they're divorced. Yes. So we've got one person from each side that uh, we deal with. So it's just kind of the, it makes things easier for us when we're dealing with one spokesperson than, you know, a hundred different voices. <laughs> yes. So, yes, I so understand. That we're getting a, a and there's, he had a big group of friends with us that just cared, that had met him once and fell in love with him, just thought he was the most amazing kid. Well, good. So. We'll remember him. You know, oh, we will. Yeah. Uh, honor his memory. That's, you know, one of the best ways. So, um, before I let you guys go, anything else? No, no, sir. no I will forward that message to you okay. so that you have that piece of it. So is, is at the end of this, we always, re, you know, a statement that all of this is, you know, true, the best yes, recollection. everything we've said uh, Nothing's been coerced or yeah. anything like that. No threats or promises have been made to you guys. No, no, just no. no sir. No. Okay. Uh, the time now is 1225 and it's a recording. You guys just got done watching that and or listening to it uh we just got done listening to it um so one thing we are going to do and you'll hear that i blanked out the names because we're not trying to dox anybody all right it's public information if you guys wanted to know exactly who that is um you can put in a foia request and find that information out i just don't want to be the one to put their names out there but this was essentially who this was this was a couple who lived very close to him uh it sounds like they were actively involved in their community um and uh drew pretty close connections to some of the other people in the community based off the statement she was saying by uh you know we tend to have hangarounds or whatever the word was she used uh for people in the area in their house so they they both knew brent kopaka very close um and they immediately go into and we'll go through it you know in a linear fashion here but they immediately go into what it was like in his apartment now The cop asked a very interesting question and said, well, can you give me an example of what was going on in the apartment when she's talking about like sexual intimidation, coercion, trying to get him to engage? Um, And and I never heard an example from her. Um, No example. No example. Just that, oh, well, so-and-so who we know was there and happened to see it. And it made them uncomfortable. That's it. Yeah, and it made them uncomfortable. And it was like aggressive and pushy and intimidating. Why I'm bringing that up is because I think that that bit of information could also be exploited by his PTSD and TBI, whereas that's just a very weird situation to be in, and that is not like... I've hung out with all sorts of people and I've never seen a situation like that where you're like roommates with someone and they're trying to literally force you. And these are some kind of, these are, these are men roommates or women mm -hmm, roommates. Men. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very strange. Yeah. It does make me wonder was because of how mentally unwell he was, was he maybe being hit on slightly or not even hit on like they're just flirty type gay guys and he's picking up on it as a threat because he's so mentally unwell at that time and then his friend comes over and maybe isn't about that maybe feels uncomfortable it's really yeah. uncomfortable around gay men and you got to remember and these are college kids yeah Mm -hmm. and they are partying like these two gay guys like maybe they're partying and having fun and the guy his friend is like so not about it that he's uncomfortable and leaves and that's seen 
like that seems to confirm Brent's delusions. Yeah. Um, Cause it could be delusions. It mm -hmm. truly could be because in this interview, it said he's using substances such as meth methamphetamine makes people paranoid on its own. Like regularly. Yes. Yeah. Without PTSD. Mm -hmm. And he has PTSD on top of this, you guys. Yep. And Meaning TBI. he was incredibly paranoid. You know, we saw the video that JS for Justice put out mm -hmm. where he was incredibly paranoid. Yeah. So it makes me wonder if, if he was really reading the situation totally the wrong way. Yeah. These are probably just two young gay guys having fun partying. Yeah. And being flirty and not pushing anything on anybody. But who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I... Agreed. I have no idea. It's definitely um, interesting. So um, another thing that I found interesting is the confirmation that, uh, you know, when he didn't stay at the house, he stayed at a hotel in Moscow. That is interesting information and that he would wander the streets at night. Yep. That he would stay in Moscow primarily um, in when a hotel. he was out in a hotel and wander the streets. I was like, ooh. That doesn't look great. That does not look great. No, that doesn't look great for anything wild going on in Moscow. You know, a lot of people have drawn connection, and I'm not trying to say that Brent Kopaka did, Kopaka did this, but a lot of people were like, hey, do you remember that police report of that guy that pulled a knife on kids, but yep. then ran away? I was right it away. It was mentioned I was like, in a press conference. One of the... One of the reporters asked Fry, is this related to that situation? Right. Yeah. And they were like, oh, no, 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 it's not related. Of course, it, nothing's related. Nothing is related, apparently. All the weird, violent things that have happened in your town, none of it is related to this instance. Yeah. It, it makes no sense. Ugh. And it makes me feel like it's very likely related. Um, but I don't know. You know, we're just this here. Escalation to, is important, you guys. Yeah. And the we're building up to it. We're just here to share the evidence. And you guys should be drawing your conclusions uh, based on this evidence. So um, the PTSD mode, she she said he's he was almost always in PTSD mode with full blown delusions and hallucinations they were at uh they were at a uh, a grocery store and he would be like hey that person over there's taking pictures of me you know that that's scary that's like schizophrenic level what? yeah that's that can be ptsd too where everyone's the enemy you were full time in an area where enemies were around you 100 percent of the time that's like the definition of military ptsd uh so it doesn't even have to go schizophrenia that's like that's like 101 ptsd um to hallucinate like that yeah for an extreme case absolutely with tbi and using well, yeah that's a it, good point you know, he's not full blown hallucinating characters that aren't there. And that is more like schizophrenia. I mean, well, like visualizing he did the, them. Well, yeah, maybe not visualizing, right. but he he thought a man was outside his hotel correct. room. Correct. Yep. Correct. Correct. And and that is a symptom of dope alone, but with PTSD and TBI on top of it. But when I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, you know, and, and I, I've got to be honest with our viewers because I'm trying to look at it from the viewer perspective and making the connections that people could be making with Brent Kopaka. And it made me think like, man, staying in Moscow, right? Could it be possible that he would go out at night and walk the street or doing dope by himself in his room, just self-medicating? And he see the, he's a soldier. A trained soldier, you guys, in the airborne division. So airborne's more trained than your basic soldier is. Um, the same training that Brett Payne had, being in the same, you know, unit. Unit, yeah. And uh, could he have been out at night and thought that 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 guy is following me? That guy's taking pictures of me. That guy is doing this, doing that, and the other. Um, and, and he makes the choice where he feels completely and totally cornered, uh, possibly on drugs, self-medicating, possibly feeling like his life is in danger. So he decides to act first. Is that a real possibility? Here? I do think so. I do think it's a real possibility um, that, that something like that could happen. Do He's I a trained soldier. I know. Um, 
Yes, he is. And he was literally like in in combat. Yeah. And uh was definitely trained in how to go into a building and take people out. And clear um, it. Yep. So one other interesting thing that I just want to bring up is that Brian Koperger is also said to stay up all night, go out running at night, um, do a lot of things at night, uh, mm. which is also very interesting to me. I, it's just another, it's it's just a weird correlation, like that it's he would go out running at night and he would be up at all hours of the night and go out driving at night. Look. It's interesting. It's interesting because we hear rumors that uh, Brian Koberger was using uppers because these uppers helped him with his headaches, his chronic headaches that he had. Um, we hear Brent Kopaka was using uppers. Uh, you know, I've heard it. I've heard where people who prefer uh, the the crystal type dope um, will use the white powder dope. Uh, in times where they can't get the crystal and I've heard vice versa both ways, you know, because uppers give that same kind of feel, even though they're different um, and do the same thing. So could they have met through something, some connection there? Could they have met because uh, addicts can see other addicts a mile away and been like, Hey man, what I'm new out here. Where, how do I get this? You know, I don't know anyone out here yet. Can you, can you help me out? Could there be some kind of connection there? I think I think the questions that the true crime community is asking here is fair. I do. Yeah, people are going to take a lot of issues with everything that was just said, though. Um, like a lot of issues. Like every time I hear any, like anytime you bring up, oh, Brian Koberger could have relapsed or been using other drugs or, you know, anything about Brent Kopaka possibly being involved. I understand why it's offensive to those people. However, in the same respect, there's a lot of issues in the Idaho 4 case that a lot of us see. A lot of us. Yeah, I'm not suggesting those things are true. We no We're way not, have enough evidence to we, even make are, that as assessment. Yes. Drawing... Pulling out the questions, okay, looking at the evidence and saying, is this possible, is not accusing somebody of it. It's asking questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Based on the evidence you see. Yep. Yep, yep. And and look, I, I, I am in full understanding that what we just heard here could just be a soldier that got hurt in war that never came back. And was struggling the entire 15 years they were back. I think it was 15 years. And um, finally couldn't take it anymore. And and the apartment shooting happened. I, th I think that's a very real possibility too, you know. But when we're looking at potential suspects in the area, like did you look for means, motive, and... Uh, Means, motive, and what is the third one? Opportunity. Yeah, means, motive, opportunity. Means, motive, opportunity. Um, it sounds like it was there. Yeah, and does that mean he did it? No. No, it does not mean he did it. It, it means he has the training and background. Uh, the motive is a potential PTSD situation that maybe there was some hallucinations and uh, delusions and the things we saw him going through and have been confirmed over and over and over he was going through. And then the opportunity is in the area and known to walk Look, around and, you know, if that were the truth, okay. If it were, and, and if it were the truth that something like that happened, it would be such a tragedy. I wouldn't judge Kopaka for that. Because he's in a, a psychotic state, okay? He's in a state where he is not aware of anything that is reality anymore. I know. Yeah, That's what makes it so tragic. That's why these kinds of people who have gone through these kinds of things that are struggling like this need help. Yeah. They are literally dangerous. To themselves and others. To themselves others. and others. Yeah. I know. And it's so 
sad, but it's also a loose cannon. We tr we train them to be, you know, the best killers in the world in the U.S. military, uh, and then don't train them how to come back from it. And Dude, it's just really sad. There's really sad. it is, and there's many cases of where PTSD veterans like this have harmed people. I know. It's no. not like it's unheard of. It happens. Yep. And in that, those situations, like, who is exactly to blame? I That's exactly. I know. I'm right there with you. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds like they didn't have a lot of VA help in this area that they confirmed in this interview. Yep. It sounds like he needed to potentially be seen and maybe medicated or at least therapy uh, and, like, weekly, daily type situation. Should have had intensive therapy okay like intensive probably inpatient for a while because he was a full-blown addict at this point yeah he needed intensive inpatient therapy mm -hmm. and help and then maybe move to outpatient where he could start rebuilding his life yeah he needed a lot of help yeah he yep. probably needed a lot of the new groundbreaking research and Dude, we have so many things they're to help. They're using mushrooms, mushrooms MDMA, yep. and they're using uh, virtual um, like recovery where they will insert them in military situations to help them f get control over those of the horrible feelings and, PTSD yeah. memories that come back in the flashbacks and things like that. And it, it's really amazing, but we're condemning that they don't have enough help, but then we're talking about how great the new technology is. But the difference is, is not all that technology is actually being used and implemented in all these VA programs. It's if you have the money to pay for this special therapy that private companies exactly. are creating and using, but the VA isn't. The VA know? is not giving it out to the veterans. You have right. to go pay for it yourself. Right. Which it didn't sound like he could support. No. In my opinion. So you, so Okay, moving on here to one of the most interesting things that was said in this entire thing, in my opinion. None of the locals around Coffee House heard the standoff. Nobody heard anything. Heard nothing. They heard a single shot when they shot Brent Kopaka. And that's it. That's insane. What? And you know what's interesting too is in so he never shot in some of the yeah in some of the footage that we have from the FOIA it shows the cop calling one of the residents and saying hey I need to get in there to get a bullet yep a bullet. Yeah. Okay, so the situation involves, uh, you know, a resident that lived across uh, the way from you, um, and there was there was firearms that were shot. Okay. Um, it, there, there, a bullet has went into your apartment. We actually uh, got a code, went into your apartment just to make sure to clear that nobody was hurt. Okay. Um, so we walked in and we body cameraed it. Went in there, found that nobody was hurt, and then. And then we left. Uh, what the reason for this phone call is? We're conducting, you know, the crime scene uh, evidence collection, and so I was hoping that I could get your verbal permission for us to enter there, get consent to search. What they're going to do is they're basically going to go in there, um, for, you know, take pictures of the affected areas, um, and then probably remove a bullet fragment. It looks like it went through the wall and it landed in your. Uh, one of your kitchen cabinet doors. Uh, that's. We are looking fine. for no other evidence other than the evidence related to, you know, a stray bullet. Uh, Singular, a bullet. Okay, where, where, well, then where are the others? Is that the bullet that you shot Brent with? Like, where is that bullet coming from? Like, what is that? What is up with that? How come where, people? Where's the bullets that you know, Brent? Shot they're is what not, we're being told. I don't think they're the only people that said they only heard a single shot. I believe many people said that even in other body cam footages. And another interesting thing she said is that Brent, she thought Brent planned this, that he thought he was going to be killed by the cops. 
Yep. From two days earlier, he left her a voice message saying, you know, that he thought that it's possible or he saw something, you know, in a memory dream, whatever, that uh, he was going to be ended by cops. So premeditated? I I don't know. Is it premeditated or is it like a premonition type thing? It's something his subconscious is telling him that he's not picking up on consciously at that time. Like what? I don't know if it could be premeditated because again, you guys like he didn't have anyone in there with him. Right. Nobody. He was by himself. Right. They they never should have shot. In my opinion. They shouldn't have. Never. I agree. Ever. He was in there alone, barricaded. I never saw a barricade. Um, yeah. What if that whole standoff was a show and they killed him like right in the beginning or something? Like, I don't oh. know. It's so weird. It, it truly is a really strange situation. I'm really would be curious to hear the prosecutor's explanation of why he thought the shot was justified I because agree. they didn't really give a great explanation. I agree. I agree. It's a very strange situation. I don't understand it. Um, I think there are a couple injustices going on here in this situation. And, you know, I I really want to know what you guys think about it. Uh, it Was this audio as eye-opening for you as it was for me? Because uh, for me, it was, ooh, the couple things in there had me like, Wow. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy interview. It it blew my mind when I heard it. Um, it's pretty clarifying in a lot of ways, but in other ways, it just raises a million more questions, doesn't it? Yeah, I agree. I'm and curious. it makes you feel really bad for this guy. Like, Oh, awful. Absolutely yeah. awful. But, I, I don't think it's okay to activate someone in the military the way that they do and then not deactivate them when they're coming home. I do not think that's okay, man. Right, right. Um, and, you know, so many people have questioned if there's like a co-defendant. I, I don't know if you could even go down that route with Kopaka because I don't think he could plan this in tandem with somebody else, to be honest. Um, mm, maybe I you think I he could. I don't know how I feel about that, but there's this idea out there. There's this story, which I don't think is true at all, but they were like, uh, so the story is that Brent and Brian were together in a car and the whole, this whole thing started at one, one, two, two, when Brent got out to like peep in the window. And when, after looking at all this and then hearing that, I'm like, dude, this guy can barely keep himself together but then we're thinking that he's gonna go like peeping on people in some weird fashion i just don't see that i don't see it no there's no way he could be like premeditated serial killer i don't think there's anything there's no way it doesn't seem that way the way the state he's in i don't think that's possible it doesn't um, feel that way. No, no I, I think the only possible scenario is a PTSD hallucination like he activated delusion. Himself. He got yeah. activated in some way. That's the only way this could even be possible. And in that situation, that's a stretch because we don't have any evidence saying he was even in that area that Correct. night. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's literally just a question. I sure hope the cops do, though. I hope they have those answers too. Because that cell phone of his needs to be data dumped, triangulated, um, and dude, he did a factory reset. But look, well, we don't know who did it, but yeah, it was factory reset. The Maddie Soto case, that guy did a factory reset conveniently the day Maddie Soto went missing. They got all those images back. Yep. And he's in there with 60 charges of abusing a minor and photos of it. Yeah. Um, and he did a factory reset on his phone. So, Correct. I mean, I hope they went through it. I hope they got the information. It doesn't sound like it, but. It doesn't know, sound I'm like it. Going to cross my fingers and hope just in case, but it doesn't feel like it. No. Because they left the phone there on the counter for yep. a friend to find. So exactly. Nobody took it to the computers and to the systems that's required to pull that information. But, you know, let me know. 
us know how you feel about it, what you thought about the audio. Is it something you heard? Has, has another creator covered these these audios? Not before? that I've heard. Hmm. Not that I've okay. heard. Well, but... it, it, I found it interesting. I thought it was eye-opening. And, uh, you know, let me know how you feel about it. 